Cheers, cheers, cheers.
Testing, test, test, test. Test, test. Just getting set up for the uh, for the broadcast. Test, test. Okay, uh, we're ready to go. So thank you very much, everyone, for turning up. This is the third in the Manawatu U3A uh, seminar series on quality of life in the third age. Um, uh, first, some basic uh, instructions. If you haven't already done so, could you please mute your phones? Uh, fire exits are at the exit signs, as you can see. Toilets are over down the corridor over there and round the corner over the other side. Um, no need to mention parking anymore, I don't think. Uh, the structure of the session, we'll have the, uh, uh, the speaker talking for approximately 50 minutes. Uh, we will then have a roving mic for questions. So please, uh, if you want to ask a question, just uh, signal. I'll bring the mic to you. And uh, if you wait until you have the mic, then everyone will hear what the question is. Um, uh, as most of you know now, the, uh, the, the uh, talk is being live streamed to YouTube and uh, you will be able to watch it at uh, any time afterwards. If you don't have the URL for that, just uh, get in touch with us and we'll point you in that direction. And I will say we have had a bigger uh, spread over a week or so, we've had bigger audiences watching on YouTube than actually turning up here. So we've had, uh, overall for this seminar series, we've had bigger attendance, bigger attendance than we have done uh, uh, for any of the seminar series in the past. So we're, we're really pleased to, to see that. Uh, okay, now our first speaker, or oh, not first speaker, <laughs> our speaker for today, uh, you have seen some of you from the last seminar series and brought back with, with popular acclaim, I believe. Uh, Professor Johan Pochreiter, uh, Professor of Robotics at the School of uh, Food and Advanced Technology. Uh, and he's the, uh, uh, you're the director of this center, the uh, Massey Agritech Partnership Research Center, uh, doing lots of interesting research. And I should mention to the U3A Science Group, you might want to see about getting a tour around there at some stage. Um, uh, let's see, the main, uh, uh, his main research interests are in the areas of additive manufacturing and advanced mechanotronics and robotics. Uh, he's been inducted into the World Robotics Education and Competition Foundation Hall of Fame, and he's created a hub for some of the most outstanding innovation robotics, IoT, that's the Internet of Things, and 3D printing. There is some very exciting stuff going on, and uh, Johan was saying that uh, although this talk was geared towards older people, with COVID and so on, the lockdowns and links in communication, it's actually of a, a much broader relevance. 
Now, I did look to see uh, some of the sorts of research that he's involved in, and uh, I saw that he's heading so many research projects, there's far too many for me to run through, and I thought there might be a quicker way to do it. And a lot of the research projects were uh, beginning with the letters PSAF. So I thought, well, if I just tell you what that is, then that will summarize what he's doing. So I looked up PSAF, and it could mean persistent atrial fibrillation. It could mean Pakistan Strategic Allocation Fund. It could mean Palmer Student Alumni Foundation, Palm Springs Arts Festival, Parents and Students for Academic Freedom, so on and so forth. Now, it may be one or more of those that he's been doing, but I do know that whatever, <laughs> whatever of those are relevant, you're going to have something very entertaining and very stimulating right now. Cool. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Stuart. Appreciate it. All right, PSAF, um, Pre-Seed Accelerator Fund. So what that is is where you get s seed money from um, investors or the university to go and try stuff that no one else tries. Um, so I'm kind of that person where I'll go and think of a project, something that's totally innovative, something that's blue sky and has impact in the world, and then you've got to go and ask for money for that. So um, I have a lot of those, and it's very exciting. Today's talk... Um, I'll be honest with you guys, when I spoke to Stuart and he said to me, please do a talk about robotics and geriatrics, um, I cringed at the word geriatrics. Um, you know, especially with the way the world is going, um, I have definitely aged in the last six months. Um, being around my wife so much, and I love her dearly, um, is, has really aged me. Being around my teenage kids has aged me. Um, dealing with staff online and Zoom calls has aged me because nobody talks about what's the future and what's exciting. They all talk about COVID and where we're at now and what are we going to do. So it, that really, I'm not that kind of person. Um, some of you who do know me in the audience, I'm a very futuristic, optimistic, what can we do in the world kind of person. So it's been a real, real toll. So I do feel a bit geriatric today. The talk is going to be, it's not a, it's not a lecture, it's not a, um, you don't have to write a test after this. I'm going to keep it very broad um, because it's so relevant to our world today. It's going to be about all about robotics and human interaction, and it's not just about old people. So please, um, let's just be open-minded open about this, this, this conversation we're going to have. If some of the slides seem very wordy, don't worry about it. I don't read slides, but I will kind of just speak around them. The reason we have the wordy slides are for those people online, so they can always go back and read them and get a bit more information. So I do like to leave an audience with something. But in my background, and Stuart already said, um, I've done a lot of stuff. Some of you I actually recognize from the last talk, but I, I've built satellites, I've built supercars, um, I've worked with multinational companies around the world. I ran a VIX robotics program as well. I've worked on surgical robots where we um, put um, radioactive isotopes into, human, uh, into people to cure cancer using robots and all kinds of stuff. So a um, bit of a renaissance man. I, I try to do as much as I can because life is so short and you just got to suck everything you can out of it. So that's kind of my philosophy in life. So um, excuse me if I ramble on about some great projects that I've done in the past, but you know we like talking about those. So the first thing I want to talk about is the digital economy. What does it actually mean? How are we transitioning from um, the, the, the real world that we have now to this world where everything is digitized by distance? We, we don't have the human interactions anymore. And the first thing we need to understand is that um, robots are coming. There's absolutely nothing we can do about that. As sure as um, there are little pink pigs in the world, we are going to have robots. Okay. Um, now, by 2030, we might be losing up to 3 billion jobs globally that will just disappear. That is not something we should worry about. The world will change, education systems will change, the way in which we operate and run businesses will change. We will all have work. The robots aren't going to displace us. AI is not going to displace us, but it's going to change us. And it's as us as humans, the most intelligent species on the planet, who do make a lot of mistakes to kind of evolve with what's going to be happening. Um, the robots are coming, and we should not fear them. We should rather see how we're going to work with these amazing machines we create. And it is actually more about policy and, and government policy 
and how the politicians are going to help us navigate this new landscape we're going to be moving in. So absolutely no fear. But let's look at a few things that have happened. We all remember Nokia and Blackberry and Kodak. Remember the Kodak cameras where you put a th little thing in the back and you close it and you wind it and it makes a noise and you click and you go on holiday and you come back three weeks later and you can't remember what photos you took and then you go to the chemist and they develop your photos and you get a pack. Well, those days are gone, right? If we think about Sears, Blockbuster movies, they're all gone. So what have we got today? So Facebook. Facebook has the most content in the world, written content, but they create none of it. It's all created by us. Putting pictures of our kids on there and, and having opinions about a decision that government has made. There's so many opinions about COVID, obviously, and about vaccinations. So we create all the content. If we look at Society One, it's the fastest growing bank in the world, but they don't actually have a building. There's not a thing where you can go and take a card and put it in a machine. That doesn't exist, right? Um, Netflix. Netflix is the largest provider of digital entertainment, but they don't own any cinemas. They don't own any buildings where you go and sit down and watch a movie like we used to. Skype, WeChat, Airbnb. They own the most, um, the largest accommodation provider in the world, but they don't own a single building. They don't own a hotel. So everything is, is shifting. Uber, of course, they don't own any cars, they don't own any taxis, but they're the largest transportation um, provider in the world at the moment. So we can see a clear shift in how the world is changing. Another example, so if we look at Uber and we look at Ford, so Uber's been around for about seven, seven years now. Ford's been around for about 103 years. Um, Uber's valued at 70 billion and Ford is valued at 60 billion. So Uber is worth more than Ford, and Ford is the company that introduced us to the automobile. And that happened in seven years. And Uber owned no cars. If we look at Airbnb and the Marriott, same kind of story. Airbnb, they don't own anything. Marriott have all these beautiful hotels. And Airbnb is worth much more than Marriott is worth at the moment. So what's that going to do to the rest of the world and business and What's it going to do one day to housing in this country? And what's it going to be like when my grandkids start wanting to buy things and buy homes and travel and see the world? And then what we do then is then we throw this thing called COVID on top of it and all the other things that are still going to happen to us in our lives. So we just got to accept that it's going to happen. And so what do we as humans do? How do we react as the most intelligent species on this planet? And that's what we just got to grapple with every day. So let's carry on looking at the age problem. So I'm using on the slide, I used the word China for a reason. So since 1950, since census was taken in China, they now, now find that their working population is drastically shrinking. China does not actually have enough people in their labor force to run their country. That's kind of scary. One of the largest populations in the world do not have enough people to run it. So we all remember in 2015 in Germany, we saw max, a mass um, migration of people across the country from Syria into Germany. All right? About a million refugees went into Germany in 2015. This was a very unpopular move by the German government, and we had mass riots in Europe, and the, the German government stopped that whole policy. What we didn't realize in hindsight is that Germany needs one and a half million immigrants every year to sustain its workforce. So right now, one and a half million people need to move into Germany every year to sustain its current workforce because of an aging population. Japan takes in about 70,000 immigrants a year. They currently need one million immigrants to sustain their current workforce. So an aging population is a massive problem. But the only solution for us at this stage is that robots are essentially going to save those countries. So let's look at countries that have a lot of robots in them. So the world leader right now is South Korea. South Korea has the most robots um, per human. So they currently have about 531 robots per 10,000 employed workers. So that's kind of the ratio. The U.S. is number eight on that list. They have 301 robots per um, 
10,000 people. China is sitting at about 59 pe uh, robots per 10,000 people. So China is way down on that list. But they are now the fastest growing robotics population in the world is in China. So um, territories like Beijing, Shanghai, those, those big metropolitan cities in China are now ha actually have subsidies to allow companies to buy more robots in to actually help with that labor force problems. So just think quietly, if China is having those problems, what's happening in New Zealand? What's happening in Australia? And the problem is much greater than we can imagine. It's much greater than we see on One News or Three News or anything like that on Stuff or in the Herald. It's a major, major problem that a lot of people just don't understand. So where do we typically use robots? We use them for military and car production and working in ducts and space exploration and they fight crime sometimes and they fix oil spills and that's where typically we see robots. Um, I was on um, the Paul Henry show many, many years ago when he was still late night and I actually was interviewed around robots being used in the military sense. So people taking robots and putting machine guns on them and, and what happens. And I can tell you a near and dear story. I actually know of an incident where somebody was actually killed by one of these machines. Um, and I actually had one of my ex-students work for this company where this happened, so it was tragic. And that student actually resigned immediately from that company just based on his moral beliefs that that's not something we should be doing, and I absolutely agree with that. So we've got to remember, robots aren't the thing we need to be scared of. We need to be scared of humans, all right? The machine is not going to hurt us if we don't switch it on and teach it bad things. People, oh, that's the problem, okay? So machines inherently will do fantastic things if we tr treat them properly, if we program them properly, and if we've got good morals. So I'm always worried about people, not robots. I'd rather be in a room with 10 robots than one person, to be quite fair. Okay, and I love people, so you can imagine how much I love robots. All right, so a question was asked of Hind um, Hendrik Christensen. So Hendrik Christensen is a very famous professor, robotics professor at um, Georgia Tech um, in, in the US. So he was really asked around um, how robots are excelling, the state of the art of robots in the US, and what does that really mean? And he said there are two main trends with the, the way that robots are improving in the U.S. and there's so, many, there's so many robots right now. We're going to have a lot of manufacturing jobs moving back to the U.S. out of especially Asia, Southeast Asia, back to the U.S. So that's going to happen. And by 2022, which is, I think it's next year, um, we're going to have a lot more autonomy around vehicles, self-driving cars. So when I say self-driving, I don't mean at this stage that the human being will be stay at home and the car will take off and go for a drive and go visit other cars in a parking lot somewhere, right? It's more about where the human is still in the vehicle and the vehicle will take over a lot of the remedial chores that is involved with driving, i.e. keep your eyes on the road and um, don't read a book while you drive and please don't watch a DVD while you drive. We can do those things now while the vehicle drives. So that technology exists. So we're going to be seeing more and more of that all right, as, as um, things progress. So will there be an increase and decrease in jobs? And he really couldn't answer that question because we don't know the full impact of what a digital economy and a robotic age is going to do on the workforce. If we think about Amazon, now all of you know who Amazon is, I hope. Um, you saw Jeff Bezos send um, William Shatner into space, so we all know who kind of Amazon and Jeff Bezos are, right? Now, Amazon is the largest online e-commerce retail store business in the world. Currently, 65% of every e-commerce transaction in the world goes through Amazon. Amazon is so powerful that one in five brick-and-mortar stores in the U.S. close every week because of Amazon. That's how big they are now. All right, so we, we can see that they have a massive role to play in the, not just the economy, but in technology and especially robotics. So now with Amazon, if you order a book online with Amazon, it's pretty sad to think, but they don't have a big library somewhere where, where somebody goes with a trolley and they find the book using the Huey Decimal system and they pull the book out and they wrap it for you in a box and send it to your home. That doesn't exist. What they do is when you order the book, they actually print the book. And they put a cover on the book, a hard cover, and they put it in a box and they send it to your house. 
So the book isn't in a sh on a shelf somewhere. So instantly, that book gets produced at the Amazon warehouse and shipped to you. They do the same thing with t-shirts. So if you order a t-shirt from Amazon, they don't have a big warehouse full of t-shirts. They just go, okay, um, Johan wanted this cute picture of a kiwi bird on a black shirt. Yep, that's the artwork. They, you click on it, and then they print the t-shirt in their buildings, put it in a box, and send it to me. So that whole manufacturing is taken away from, obviously, what we believe t-shirts which came from China or whatever it might be. That's now done at a central store somewhere in the U.S. or in New Zealand or wherever Amazon, Amazon might have a factory. So already, it's changing. And in my last talk, I actually spoke about 3D printing at home and 3D printing close to where you are, not shipping goods anymore. And we can see that now with the way that life is going. This is a scary one. And I want you to really think back about, back to your youth when I, when I talk about this one. Think about it. Any kid born today will never experience the thrill of driving a car. So if you're born today, by the time you turn 15, you will not drive a car the way we did as 15, 16-year-olds, going to that drive-in movie, going to meet your boyfriend or girlfriend at their home and being scared of their parents and all those things we went through. That won't be happening. You'll, on a, your phone, call somebody, a car will come and fetch you, you'll get in the car by yourself, the car will drive you somewhere, you'll get out, you'll never drive. What a shift in culture that's going to be. We know what happened in the 50s and 60s with the post-war culture and driving and hot rods and um, going to buy, get a milkshake and diners and fast food. What is the next 15, 20 years going to look like? Scary, but very exciting, and I really hope I get to see it. Um, so currently in the U.S., so we also, once again, it's not all the robots' fault. I want to just keep on emphasizing this. Six million jobs in the U.S. currently that cannot be filled. And the reason it cannot be filled is purely to do with the education system. So in Georgia, 34% of kids who leave school leave without a high school diploma. That is a lost generation. That is a lost generation of kids who actually cannot get through an education system. And I was speaking to Stuart earlier. We see this at Massey University. We see this at my, at my son is at, at, at Palmy Boys High. There's going to be a lost generation of kids because of COVID. You know, they talk about, Chris Hipkins talks about, um, we're going to have derived grades for kids when they, if they can't sit their NCA exams and all these things. But those kids actually have to still learn something. You need to actually still learn how to multiply two numbers together or how to analyze a piece of written work. Well, you still have to go learn a piece of history because that gives you richness as a human being. Education is not about how well I can write an exam or how well I can put marks together so that I can get a diploma or go to university. I have to learn something. And that's our biggest fear is that we're going to be losing a generation of kids because of the way the education system was not ready for this moment. And let's be fair to them. No criticism. None of us were ready for this moment. If I said to any one of you three years ago, there will be a day where you're going to be sitting in an audience listening to this funny person with a strange accent from another country wearing a mask on your face in an auditorium where you have to be socially distanced from your friends, you'd say, Johan, please go back home and stop drinking. All right? We've got to accept that the world is going to change and we've got to be resilient for these changes. And it's in some parts, it's, it's our attitudes and how we, we accept it and how we take that on board. It, it can also be very exciting, but very scary. All right, so let's talk about telepresence. So telepresence is basically the concept of how do I communicate with somebody when they're not with me? So we've seen this with Zoom calls and Skype calls and WhatsApp and WeChat and Signal, and there's many ways to communicate. But it's essentially being able to communicate with a human being when you're not there. And I was saying to Stuart earlier, some, at some point in our lives, and I'm not saying everyone, if it's never happened to you, you're very lucky, but who here has tried to have a long-distance relationship when they were younger? Very difficult. They don't work. Even when we have Zoom and Skype and WhatsApp, a long-distance relationship just, it, it, it's not the same. A lot of times you break up and it just doesn't work out. Imagine trying to have a long-distance relationship with a client, with a business partner, 
with a new initiative you want to try. If you can't have a relation, if a, re- a long distance relationship doesn't work with a loved one, somebody that you, you love with all your heart and respect, how's it going to work with a client that's difficult? A client that maybe you don't like, but you've got to work with them because they're a client. You've got to be professional. So that's very difficult. Um, so this company called Ava have developed a Essentially, a, a teleconference robot that very, looks very slick. It'll be, if we had it, yeah, it would run around here and go up to you and it would talk to you and you could see my face if I was sitting at Massing, we could have a conversation. But it's still just that. I can't see the whites of your eyes. I can't look at your entire body to look at your, your body language, whether you're actually engaged with me or whether you actually enjoy what I'm saying to you. So that's going to be very difficult and it's never going to really improve you know, putting more pixels on the screen, making it better high definition, is not going to be the trick. There has to be something else. So it's got its place, and it's still very um, immature teleconferencing or telepresence, but it, it's going to develop, and we see where it goes. Um, this is an interesting one. So the Beam robot is for telehealth. So they should have been using these in MIQ facilities. So what it essentially is, the same kind of robot comes up to you, and on the other side of that is a doctor, a nurse, somebody who can actually speak to you. There's now the drive to develop these tele-medical uh, robots whereby they could actually take a, a sample of liquid or they could actually analyze something in your home. You know, they could maybe t- look at your glucose level to see um, at what point you need some insulin or what your, your, your glucose levels might be. They might be able to assess you for... Even COVID, there's now technologies whereby you could just breathe and we can detect COVID. They haven't been approved by FDA, and that's why we don't have them in this country and other places around the world. But that kind of technology is coming, and that's what a, a telemedical uh, robot could do for you. We've had telemedical robots for many years. Um, there's a Vodafone ad that's been, that was very popular where you saw the dog was injured, and then um, vets from, from Japan were operating on the dog locally in New Zealand using 5G with a a Da Vinci surgical robot, so that kind of stuff exists. We have robots that kind of can do um, medical procedures on the human body, but that's not quite telemedicine. Telemedicine is where I can talk to a specialist, where I can interact with with a uh, a specialist or a a nurse or a medical worker at distance, but it's got to be more than just a conversation. Right now, it's just a conversation. Very immature still, but it will develop and it has to. And researchers all around the world are working on this problem right now. Don't worry too much about how much is on that slide, but it's all just about it's evolving. It's cost effective. The opportunity for us to speak to a surgeon or a a specialist far away is very valuable. Imagine how cool it would be if we had um, tele-robots with us now, whereby um, if I leave MIQ or let's say I do have COVID and I'm lying at home and that robot could just every day just check up on me. How are you doing, your hun? Are you okay? How's your breathing? Let's test your breathing. Let's test your oxygenization of your blood. Let's look at your heart rate. Send those, all those results back to some, some doctor. So I'm going to show you in the next slide. Um, this young man's name is Ken Evo. I, I, I love what he's done. He's basically described to you um, his AI project he's been working on. Um, and the reason I'm introducing the video, because when I click, it goes straight into the video, so I'll give you a bit, bit of background. He's been working on this project called EV, which is essentially an AI system that he built into somebody's home. Um, they're, they're an elderly person, and this AI actually looks after the person. And he's got a fascinating story about what happened, and this is very recent. A couple cool updates for EV here for you guys. Um, a while ago, I told you guys about my neighbor who's in a wheelchair. Evie's actually in her house right now. She's my prototype. She's my test subject. Whenever she rolls up to the door, the RFID sensor triggers and senses her wheelchair. And then it verifies it that her phone is in the same place. Evie automatically opens the door for her and then tracks her as she comes through the door. As your wheelchair crosses the sensors, it automatically closes and locks the door behind her. I've been working on this new stroke system and um, my neighbor, uh, the last week, she had a, a heart palpitation, which caused her to stop breathing. And for the first time ever, Evie saved a life. Evie saved her first life. She stopped breathing and she did this. This is her personal signal that she needs help. Last week, she, she did it. Gave her the signal, Evie did 
everything flawlessly. She called the cops. She automatically gave them all the data they could ever need. There's no lack of communication. There's no time in between. There's no time to trace a call. They got to her house in three and a half minutes. When they got there, Evie already automatically unlocked the door, opened the door, and the entire time she spent, she was like, location, dining room, location, dining room, which is perfect. They were telling me this story when I talked to them afterwards, and they're like, yeah, we walked in the door and this, this robot was telling us that it was in the dining room. And that's where they found her. That's where we found, they found her in the wheelchair. They resuscitated her, they got her to the hospital. They said that if they didn't get to her as fast as they did, she would not be here today. How, how cool is that? I was blown away. I thought that, you know, like, she would do great things. But this is the first life, first human life she's ever saved. That's what spurred this whole thing of converting over into being a content creator. All right, cool. So cool, inspiring story. So a young man created this AI called Evie. Um, the, the lady would go up to the house, Evie would open the, the door for, the, for, for this lady, Evie would lo look after her every day, um, Evie is essentially a robot that moves around in the house. When she had a stroke, Evie could phone the police, give the medical, um, uh, medical workers all the, the patient's um, medical history, and they saved her life. That's great, that's what telemedicine needs to be. That's what we need in our homes to help us to live when we, whether we're young or old, doesn't matter what our medical problems are, that's the technology that we should be working on, all right? And that essentially is what, what I think the future of telemedicine needs to be, is where we have these things that work alongside us, with us, not against us. Um, this is old little Astro. Astro is an Amazon robot, so he's quite popular. Um, Astro goes around the house and just interacts with you and talks to you and has, has got a bit of a sense of humor and if you bump it, it'll probably tell you off and all kinds of things. But we're trying to bring life into these machines. Um, it's quite funny when I, it's weird. When you describe your car your, that you're driving, you always describe it as a, a female. Uh, you describe a female gender. And when I talk about robots, I always make them male and I don't know why. So... And I see a lot of robot, robots have are, are got male names as well, so I don't know what it is, but cars are female and robots are male, so that's something weird us engineers also do. I would like to talk to you a little bit about some case studies of robots. So these are my personal projects I've worked on. These are the things that I've tried to do to push the advances of robotics, but it also shows how humans are interacting with robots and, and what's actually happening. So this first case study, I worked for a company called Bell Equipment in South Africa in Richards Bay. I was a very, a very young man, I had a lot of hair, um, I wasn't grey, and life was totally different at that stage. I must have been in my early 20s. This company asked me to install a big welding robot. So they make these big earth-moving machines, they drive in the mines. The wheels are taller than me, the tires on, the, on those trucks, they're massive. And um, we installed this robot to weld parts of the, the, the big diggers. I got back the next morning and my heart was broken. I, I think I literally cried. What happened the, the night before is some of the workers who worked there were, felt threatened by this machine being put in that would weld, so they thought they were gonna lose their jobs. So they took baseball bats and hammers and they destroyed the robot. They killed it, okay? And the reason I did that is because the, the managers of the plant didn't communicate with the workers what the robot's for, what it's going to do, it's there to help them. And this was the, the most surreal moment for me. We had to go and hire a security guard with a gun to protect the robot. And we're talking about early 90s. So already there was that feeling of, we don't know what this machine does, we're going to destroy it, and we had to have a man guard a machine because the other men didn't understand. So it was that whole relationship breakdown between the managers and the workforce and what the, the purpose of this robot is. They now have many robots and they have a, they're a very productive company and they do great things. Um, but that was, that was the first time I actually realized there's a problem. There's something we're missing. This was a great one. So um, young student, I'm in Mozambique. So Mozambique is on the east coast of Africa. Um, war torn, a lot of civil, civil wars raged through there for many years. 
and we built a demining robot. So what this robot would do, it would move it along a road, and the road is just a gravel road, and had these massive chains on the front, and these chains would hit the road. And as it hits the road, the landmines blow up. So you walk behind it, and in front you've got all these explosions. And as you walk over this area where there were the landmines, people behind you come and they actually lay tar seal on the road. The reason we do that is because we don't want the terrorists to come back that night and plant landmines again. So we put tar seal down. Because if, you, if the tar seal is dug up and there's a, a mountain of tar seal, you know there's a landmine. Right? So we had to quickly tar the road as we moved. So that was quite exciting as well, to understand how quickly we had to work and how we were changing communities and people's lives so people could actually travel from one part of the country to the other for trade or visiting family without being blown up. So that was, that was a cool way to see how robots changed the humanitarian um, process in that country. This case study is CDAX. This is a local Palms North company that some of you might know. Um, this little robot drives around and measures the pasture, the length of the pasture in the paddocks, and then transmits that data back to the farm manager. And the farm manager can then decide how much fertilizer to actually put into all the paddocks to optimize milk production of dairy cows. Um, this robot, um, myself, my team built the first prototype, and CDAX have actually now commercialized it. But what's cool about this robot that I didn't understand at first is that this robot drives about 80 kilometers a day all by itself. It goes out in the morning and drives through all the paddocks. It crosses over roads. It goes on the fences. And it just comes back at night and just parks itself, charges, and downloads all its data. That's pretty cool that you can build something and just can go and do that. What does it mean to the farmer? Well, the farmer doesn't actually have to get on his quad bike anymore and, and pull a small trailer behind through all his paddocks and do this manually. He can go now focus on something else in his operation or just spend more time with his kids or his wife, all right, which he might enjoy. Case study number four, so this is for Transpower. That's actually me on the right. That's my Transpower robot. So we have got these robots in substations around the country that monitor the power grid in real time. So these robots sit in what we call a dog box, and when the power goes down in a region, they run out into the substation and go try and find the faults. What we also do with them now, we're actually programming them to drive around the substations every day by themselves and just take photos of all the things in the substation and then make decisions around when things need to be repaired and maintained and fixed. All right? What has it done? Well, Transpower have had these in some of the substations. There's one in 2i. Cost of accidents have come down. You don't need to send a man in a van anymore to the substation to go do inspection. The robots do them. No more deaths on the road. The accident rates have come down, all right? So that substation worker can actually get back to their family tonight. They're not spending six, seven hours on the road to get to remote substations. That's what that has done. Productivity is up. Transpower is super happy. And we're now spinning out a global startup that will be putting these robots all around the world into substations and mines around the world. This is a fun one. Um, we're building a forestry robot. We were out in Lake Taupo Forestry Trust um, last Tuesday. I was, I was there two days before COVID hit, so I'm okay. We did check. And this robot actually drives in the forest all by itself, fully autonomously, and delivers trees to the planters. So the people who plant the trees don't have to carry the trees on their backs anymore. The robot takes the trees to them. On the right, you'll see the, the elephant tr um, trunk. We're actually building an elephant trunk arm that will grab the trees gently and actually pass them to the workers without damaging the trees. So that's one of the research projects we're working on now. So that's a lot of fun, but it's got a serious reason for doing it. Because of COVID, we have a lot of challenges in this country whereby we cannot pick fruit. We cannot pick apples or kiwi fruit. We don't have enough labor. We've heard about this quite a bit. We've just developed a, a concept of a project, a pre-seed accelerator fund project, Stuart, whereby we put a big robot in, in an apple orchard, and the robot moves down the apple orchard very slowly. It moves about one meter, takes about six minutes to move one meter, because that's the speed at which people pick apples. But in front of the robot, we have special cameras, and those cameras build a three-dimensional image of the orchard for me. We transmit that image to Fiji, and in Fiji, a apple picker sits in front of their computer, 
with a mouse and clicks on the apples for me. And while they click on the apples, the machine drives through with robot arms and picks the apples. So those pickers don't have to leave Fiji anymore. So my biggest dream before I vacate this place is I want to see a world in which we have 10 of these machines moving down an orchard. And we've got young kids at school who need to make some money. And every time they click on an apple, they get a cent. And every time they don't click on an apple, I take off two cents. Because that'll teach them a lesson. All right? That's telepresence. That's the future of robotics. Where we as humans can use the top six inches above our shoulders because we're good at that. Evolution has made me the best at picking an apple. I know what an apple looks like. I know an apple is not a Ferrari. A Ferrari is a big red thing. But trying to teach a robot, that's an apple, that's a Ferrari. Pick the apple, not the Ferrari. Because if you damage the Ferrari, you're going to pay a lot of money. Pick the apple. Humans are amazing at that. Machines are terrible. But if we as humans can click on the apple and the robot can go and pick that apple, we've changed the world. That's where we need to be going, and that's where we are going. So that's a big research project I'm working on at the moment. I'm very excited about that project. All right, I've got to give you a bit of intro, because if I don't, you think this is science fiction, you're going to tell me, honey, you're lying. Do we know who the Mowbrays are? Zuru, I spoke about them last time, the toy company. Yes? Yeah, Matt Mowbray, Nick Mowbray, Anna Mowbray, from Canterbury, the billionaires who live in the Kim.com mansion. Yep. Bunch of balloons, those ones, yeah, who put plastic all over the place, yep, those ones. So Matt Mowbray um, is a very good friend of mine. Um, actually, I was on the phone with him yesterday. I'm actually trying to solve a problem on his super yacht for him, but that's a whole different project. And he's been working on a housing project for about 11 years. You would have seen something in the Herald about a housing project in the Mowbrays. What he's done, in, in he's developed a prototype factory in China where they're building houses architecturally design houses and very quickly using robots. It's a dark factory. There's no humans in the factory. So they, if you want to design this building, that's a straight wall, that's a straight wall, there's a wall, bit of an angle, there's a roof. You load all of this data into their manufacturing package, and then that wall gets cast as a solid big wall with rebar in massive furnaces. They come out and robots actually cut the angles on those walls. They put them into containers, ship them here, and then they actually get assembled. They also paint the walls in China before they come, but they don't paint them, they actually print them. So the whole wall goes through a big printer, and they print the color on. So you can have your face on the wall if you wanted to, all right? Or a pretty picture of Mona Lisa if you want, they'll print that for you on the wall, okay? So they've been working for 11 years. Um, they were supposed to launch their first house, but that was pre-COVID, so that's out of the, not happening at the moment. And I've actually asked him for the first house in Manawatu to be my house because he does owe me a lot of favors. I've made a lot of money for him. So what I'm going to show you now is a video showing how the software works, and you'll see them designing a house. At the bottom, you'll see Matt Mowbray sitting with the um, Thai president, um, Thai president in Thailand where they're building this big factory. Now, to give you a bit of si uh, an idea about scale, the factory is so big that one production line is three kilometers long. So when you stand in the beginning of the production line, a straight line, you cannot see the end of it because the earth is curved. That's the size of the factory, just to be a bit of context, okay? They will revolutionize the building industry in this country, worldwide, globally. Now, all of us know that the average house price is $2,500 to $4,000 a square meter to build a house today. His cost price on a house is less than $250 a square meter to build. How great will that be? My kids can finally own a home if we go to his system. But here's the catch, human beings. I was at a meeting with Matt Mowbray, and a developer walked up to him and said to him, 
I want to be the first person to use your housing system in New Zealand because I can still charge $2,500 a square meter but, but buy it for two fifty dollars from you. Therein lies the problem. It's not the robot's fault. It's not the AI's fault. It's not the factory's fault. It's us. Okay? So I'll play the video and then we can see how he does it. There's a house. You've got thousands of them you can pick. That's what it looks like inside. You can even pick the furniture if you want. They'll deliver that as well. There you can sit at home in real time and build your house in front of your computer. No skill. You can put in a wall. You can put in a window. You can put in a roof. Um, the software will automatically fix the, sh the, the space of the place where the window has to be based on our building regulations. You can pick your floor color, whether you want carpet or wood or tiles. And the entire house gets shipped to you in pieces. They put it up and there's your house, already painted, done. All the wiring and plumbing are already in the walls. They literally just connect. This video is about three years old. You can see what they're doing now. Very sophisticated. This is how robotics can change the world. Think of two examples only from today's presentation. Building homes and saving that lady having a stroke. Robots already changed the world. Please love the robots, because I promise you robots love you, okay? Okay, so hybrid workforce. So it's not robots and people, it's people with robots. That's what the new hybrid workforce needs to be. We work alongside these machines and they help us. Are there gonna be accidents? Of course. Are robots gonna make mistakes? Yes, because they're only learning. They're like children. And they're gonna make mistakes and they're gonna injure people. We need to keep on going and persevere because they will save our lives. They will make this a better planet for us if we allow them to. We should not be scared of technology. So one of the problems though, and this is the big fundamental problem we have, if a chatbot goes rogue, let's say you've got a robot in your, you've got a beautiful dress shop, it's a family business, you've built it for 40 years, and I say to you, put a robot in there, and this robot sits there, and as the clients come in, it interacts with the clients. Imagine that robot starts swearing at a client. Now who's in trouble? You as the owner of the robot? Is the robot in trouble? Or is the programmer in trouble? Whose fault is it? I don't know. That's going to be one of the biggest problems. It is around liability, insurance, policy, regulations. That's what we need to solve as human beings. All right. So thank you very much. I've seen the future, and it works, and it's going to be amazing. And don't fear the robots. Thank you very much. Okay, that's given us a few things to think about. Now, uh, open to questions. If you have a company that's say 100, 50 of them are robots, 50 are humans, robots don't pay tax, Hum the robots won't get paid, so how's that taxation system going to work? Because okay. the taxation system pays a lot of services like superannuation, Absolutely. health services, education, etc. All right, so the first thing is you're absolutely right. The robots don't pay taxes, but you've got to remember that taxation is only based on what your company pays you that you pay back to the government, right? So if I get taxed for, at 33% because I'm in a higher tax bracket, which I, I obviously pay 33% tax, then that means I can only pay 33 cents on the dollar when Massey University pays me a dollar, right? So at the end of the day, the taxation can just bypass me as the individual, Massey University can pay the government directly 33 cents on the dollar without me actually doing it. 
once again, it comes down to policy and how we deal with that. But it's much more efficient if that tax just goes straight to the government as opposed to coming through me. So don't think of me as I'm now a robot, I don't pay tax, and now I'm a human, I pay tax. Think of it as I'm a productive entity being thing. I'm a productive entity being thing. The company is responsible for that tax. Because at the end of the day, when that robot goes in there, their productivity goes up, all right? Um, everything about that company become more efficient, they make more money, they produce better goods, better quality goods, they should be paying the government directly. So it is going to be a change in our taxation laws, very similar to the way we deal with taxation laws around Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, and all those big corporate companies that aren't paying those taxes. Com countries need to pay, take charge of that. Does that answer your question? Cool. 100%. 100%. Um, uh, to really blow your mind, we've got, all got to understand that, that the concept of money is a, a, a man-made construct. Um, if it's a man-made construct, I'm sure as men, we can mess with it. All right. Cool. Sorry. Right. Um, my question is about the costs of these and their environmental impact and their production. 100%. Yep, that's good. Uh, I was actually thinking about that earlier today. Um, in terms of production of robots, yes, there's a lot of resource needed to, to make those robot bo bodies, all the electronics in there, so that's going to always be there. One thing robots don't do, though, they don't rely on dairy. No, I think I have to say more. I understand. So, so what I'm trying to get at, that argument, it comes from both sides. As a human being... Um, I do a lot of harm to this planet, driving here, eating, um, being. So is that robot going to be better after five years of its existence? Because it's going to be better than me and the way I treat the planet. But it's going to be a very um, unsustainable in its first five years of its life. We're going to see that. We're going to see that um, when I was a baby, I wasn't... I didn't, have, I didn't burden, burden the planet much. But as my diet changed and I got a bit bigger, my sustainability curve probably went down. We will find with a robot the curve will go up. That's also quite scary, that one day maybe we would prefer to only have robots around. I hope not. It's only my opinion. Okay. So guide me a little bit if you don't mind, sorry. The electronics industry is already going very hard on the planet. We're yes. already having a lot of problems with electricity. We're going to have more. Now the planets that we have got are not sustainable. How can robots in any way deal with those sort of well? Okay come okay. to terms with them. No, no, cool. All right, I get the, I get the question now. Sorry about that. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, electronics, making wafers and making electronic circuit boards out of polymers, because they're made out of polymers, is not sustainable for us. We've got the same conundrum we have around biomaterials. I don't have a solution for you right now. I can, though, tell you about one of the exciting projects that I've just started, and I hope... It, it's, it's, it's so blue sky, and it's, a, it's, it's really the beginning of, I hope, something great. I've, l I've figured out a technique to harvest energy from trees. Okay? So as a tree grows through its natural life, I've figured out ways to actually take electricity from a tree. And we do that by, there's a few techniques. The one technique is by the tree actually swaying and moving. So when we have wind breaks we put into forests, we can actually generate energy for local communities. We can also generate energy from the electrostatic charge between the ground and the actual tree. There's an electrostatic charge between those two. We can harness that energy as well. And then there's another interesting one where there's a temperature gradient between the base of the tree and the top of the tree, and we use PLT devices to extract heat energy from those trees. So those are the kind of things that we need to be looking at, but the same problem. I'm using those electronics. I'm using polymer electronic circuit boards to harness that energy today. So the real solution there is it's a materials problem. It's not a robotics problem. That's where we should be focusing 
where the scientists should be working, changing materials. And I think, I think you and I would definitely agree that, unfortunately, plastic is probably the greatest material ever made by engineers. I mean, if it wasn't for plastic, we couldn't be doing this today. That chair you're sitting on half it wouldn't exist. Um, those cameras wouldn't be there because the circuit boards wouldn't exist. We wouldn't have half the thing. We couldn't go to the moon without plastic. That's the problem. It's, it's such a great material, but we need to transition away from it. We need to be finding something, and it's a materials problem. It's not a robotics problem. It's not an electronics problem. It's a pure materials problem we can't solve right now. And it's a resource problem. You're absolutely right. The one thing that I, that I really don't like is that we are, we've got this, this drive to go to another planet to just mess it up again, where we really have an opportunity to fix. It's not too late to fix. Let's fix where we are, because this is where all the brains and the, the, the resources are to fix this planet, but we want to go to a different one. Um, I don't know if you're familiar but with the science fi sci-fi movie, The Matrix. Yep, some of you are. The Matrix, I remember this, this, this one phrase where the machines are interacting with the, the lead character, Neo, and they say to Neo, Human beings are the greatest parasites ever created. We, we inhabit a rock and we kill a rock. That's, that's, that's a mind shift change. That's a policy change. That's a, that's a change we have to make fundamentally. It's not the robot. It comes down to us. So I hope that kind of answers it. I, I do understand what you're saying, but it's a problem of materials. It's a problem of people. We've got to get more sustainable. Okay. What size of amount of funding would be required for each of the projects? If I asked you, sure. given plenty of uh, abundant money, sure, sure. the next five projects that you'd like to see funded, how much would each of these be? And it's small amounts, medium amounts? What, how oh, much? yeah, so, so look, some of the pre-seed funds, I mean, I've done some, we can do some amazing things with $20,000, you know. Um, we've done some great things, and some of these projects do take $5 million, it just depends on, um, here's, the, here's, the, here's the terrible thing. I find that when they are commercial projects, they're much cheaper than um, university-run research projects. So if most of us academics just switched our thinking and went, we are now going to start doing these projects for industry and commercial solutions, solving those material problems, solving those energy problems, for commercial reasons, commercial drivers, I find the projects actually become cheaper. Because it's not just about doing a project because it sounds like cool science or it's fun to do. When you move into commercial, you need to be able to save that dollar. You need to be able to be you understand budgets. You need to understand resources much better. So then you start using less money. That's just an experience. But anything from twenty to thirty thousand dollars for the smaller ones, and they can go up to five million. I've been in projects where, you know, they've been twenty million dollar projects. But uh, we've we've done great things with small amounts of money as well. Okay. Cool. Anything else, Stuart? Talking about uh, the the sort of applied type research, and it would be very good to do that. But isn't one of the focuses of university the basic research? Absolutely. Fundamental research. So, so being able to expand human knowledge through fundamental research is, is what universities and CRIs do. Absolutely. Um, but there's got to be a balance. You know, it's great as a university professor to have hundreds of publications and you've got chapters and books and I've published books and psychology books even on this topic. That's great having that book on the shelf, but that book on the shelf does not impact New Zealand. It doesn't actually contribute to better lives of people around the country. So it, it, in the beginning of your careers, you'll find a lot of academics build those publications and build those big academic research projects. But as you become a little bit more mature, and maybe that's where I am now in my life, you do kind of want to leave a legacy of, I've actually done something. I mean, I've actually gone and changed the planet for the better, or I came up with something that changed somebody's life, or I saved one life. You know, those are the things that, that, that's important as well. Okay. And cool. 
if there isn't another question, one that I'll throw in, because you were talking about driverless cars and so on. This, this is actually a topic that's highly relevant for many of the people here. There's going to be a stage for many of us when they say, sorry, you can't drive anymore. That's Will right. driverless cars be there in time for us? Uh, <laughs> um, to be, Stuart, um, they exist. Um, I was in Salinas Value in California pre-COVID, so 2019, I think it was July, it was summer there, it was really hot. I was in Salinas Valley, and we were driving back to, the, um, to, Cal to, to LA, and we took a pit stop, and there was this abandoned military airport. They had these massive walls, and obviously, being who we are, we kind of peered over the walls, and they had all these autonomous cars on this aircraft base driving around by themselves. Um, using all the Google Photos and all those things, driving around, stopping at traffic lights. They built this whole basic, almost a town on this army base where these cars were just driving by themselves. So it's all there. It's just the politicians need to allow us to switch it on to go. No, no, yes. no, but, but sure, a system like that can work when all the things on the road are those Absolutely. Vehicles. So the problem, once again, Stuart, people. Yep, people. Something interesting for, us, for all of you, just a little anecdote, little story. Whenever you go onto a website and you're trying to buy something and pay, is, some of you have ever seen those where suddenly there's a picture on the screen that says, can you find the cyclist? Or can you find the traffic light? Yes? You know what that is for? Google is using you to label all their image data. So Google take photos of things, bicycles and traffic lights and all the rest of it, but they still need you to tell the machine, that's a traffic light, that's a bicycle, that's a, a, a zebra crossing. So they're actually using you to label all their data for free. They clever, those guys, eh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, Johan, you've given us, uh, once again, some food for thought. Thank Just um, with regard to that driverless car thing, there's a, real, there's a real bonus coming on this one. Boy races. They're going to vanish. We'll don't, find something else to do. Don't tell them that it's coming. For we'll God's we'll sake. find something else to do. <laughs> Lime scooters. There you go. Yeah. I actually, um, I, many years ago, when I was in Auckland, I did a project whereby we developed these. Um, you know, you got your speed cameras when you drive too fast, but these were sound cameras. So when cars were too loud, they took photos of uh. your car. That was not popular. <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, robotic story to share with you, which I'm sure you will appreciate. When my wife and I retired four or five years ago, we started splitting up the duties in the house. Who's going to do what? When it came to vacuuming, nobody wanted it. We now own an iRobot. An iRobot is an amazing piece of kit that basically you stick it in the middle of the floor and you push the button and it, and it vacuums the floor. When you look at it, you think it's gone insane because this doesn't go up and down in rows. It belts all over the place. But by the time it's finished, the floor is clean. If it gets a bit close to the end of the battery, it hikes itself. It's a bit like the CDAX machine. It yeah. goes back home and charges itself. And occasionally it gets stuck under the oven and can't, can't get out. It, then it yells at you to say, Oi, I can't get back to be charged. So there are some things about robotics that are already here. Um, I consider it a blessing every day. We've actually got one upstairs and one downstairs <laughs> because you don't want to carry the damn thing down the stairs. <laughs> the stairs are wooden and, oh, okay, but the thing would actually cope with the stairs, but it would only cope with the top one because it's got a sensor. When it gets to the end of it, it turns back. There's this other little, little hoodacky that you could put in a doorway and, and, it, and it tells the iRobot, don't go through there, it, just do that side. Does it shift the beds? No, it doesn't shift the beds. But it can, it can vacuum closer to the legs of the bed than I'm prepared to do. Yeah. Anyway, Johan, on behalf of the U3A, no, thank, thank you, thank you very, very much. much. No, you're for, very welcome, um, I appreciate it. Cool, thank you. And we hope to see you all here again next week for the last uh, of the series. We'll have um, Kristen Holston here next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.